So this is Suzanne, and I'm the supervisor from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. So thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. I'm excited that Karen is here with us today to talk about policy writing. Do you want to go ahead and get your slides ready, Karen? I'm going to start off the webinar with a few announcements. Uh, this webinar is provided as part of our webinar series, um, Indiana State Library Services. So to register for ever, other webinars available for this series or other trainings, be sure to see our events calendar, which can be found on our website at library.in.gov under Services for Libraries. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, be sure to see our continuing education website. We are going to be announcing our 2018 webinars starting, um, I think, at the uh, around December the 21st. So we'll have something on the listserv then uh, having all of those. So we do try to stay connected to library staff across the state. I hope a lot of you guys are already subscribed to the Wednesday Word. And also, let's talk a little bit about sound issues. If you have any sound issues during the webinar, please see the sound issues box that's just below the chat box. If there's a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat box. Um, but at this time, we're not experiencing any global sound issues. If by chance you are unable to resolve a sound issue that you are experiencing on your end, we are recording this webinar and we will be um, archiving it so that you can get to it later. And also we will have your LEU available for download at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Karen Ainsley. I do want to let you guys know that I'll be monitoring the chat box today, so if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box. And actually, Karen, we already have one question, so I'll just quickly ask you this. So the question was, is this only for public libraries? Uh, the, yes, the focus is on public libraries, on small and medium-sized libraries, but it does have applications to all libraries when you think in terms of policies as far as uh, uh, user expectations and, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, it would have application to other types of libraries. Okay, thanks, Karen. All right, I want to begin my presentation by reading the first paragraph in the Public Library Policy Writer, and I do have this resource listed at the end of the uh, slides. Every librarian knows a colleague or has heard of a situation in which the lack of a policy or having an obsolete or poorly constructed policy has led to a public relations nightmare. Unfortunately, in today's ever-changing world, we often think of policy manuals, but ask ourselves and our colleagues, who has the time anymore to sit down and review policies, much less write new ones? So I'm coming from it from that viewpoint, that you really do need to take the time to write policy, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better understanding uh, of that writing process and what kind of policies are needed. So to begin, as I said, this is uh, for small and medium-sized libraries on assessing the needs of a policy, drafting, reviewing, and revising. It is important for policies to conform to current law and are reasonable. Library policies are informed by the library's professions, ethics, and confidentiality practices, and we'll talk about that too. And the library board, director, and staff need to be attentive to the library policies that support the library and the staff and are fair to everyone. And as we mentioned with that introduction, it's so that you have good public relations at the, that's ultimately what you want to have. And it is the library board's job to set policy. Policy are often about relationships. And the one that comes to mind is the policy is a code of conduct or a directive or expectation. This sets the expectation of behavior in the library for patrons, and policies are typically described as a principle or rule to guide decisions and achieve rational outcomes. Now, I know I said patrons, but this also includes what the patrons can expect of the staff and in, in their behavior. Policy, written policies ensure effective and efficient running of the library. And they are informed by your long-range plan and your mission statement that supports the library's plans, goals, and objectives. It ensures that the staff have the information to do their jobs. 
It not only governs what you do today, but it also guides uh, your future decision. It assures the public of what they can expect from the library and that they are treated equitably. It provides a basis for consistent resource allocation, that is your collection and your services, and it provides a direction and consistency in the day-to-day -day service to the community. It provides support to the staff and board in the event of complaints or legal action. And it also prepares the library director and staff to respond in emergencies. On this slide, you can see that I've divided into two kinds of policies, operational and managerial. My focus today is on the operational, the ones that have to do with the uh, behavior and expectations in the library. During the course of this presentation, I give policy samples and examples such as collection development that deals with the interactions, well, deals with the collection and what um, those expectations are, especially if someone objects to one of your book. Also policies that deal with interactions that guide patrons and staff. So I talk mostly about operational ones and not the managerial ones that you probably traditionally find in a personnel manual. So usually what happens in the library is there's a need for you to uh, create a, a policy. And this need comes to mind because you uh, see a recurring problem and to summarize, it becomes apparent under these circumstances because of a recurring problem or a new service that you're offering or if you see your staff that having inconsistent delivery of your services and how things happen in practice. Again, this reiterates the same uh, idea. Maybe you have one staff member who is strict about noise in the library and expels teens who get rowdy, or another staff member might be a little more lenient. Or perhaps you have the service of interlibrary loan, and when a patron comes in and you don't own a book that they request, some staff offer to borrow through interlibrary loan, and others do not readily offer the interlibrary service. Policy would require a particular response to the situation that's consistent across staff members. So what goes into creating policy? You have to study the background and the issues. And some of the things that will happen is that you're reviewing your policies and you haven't reviewed them in a while and it doesn't reflect current practice, so you may have to revise a policy. Sometimes we see this when uh, you start having a, a coffee shop and you have to modify about uh, drinks in the library and so forth. So keep them current, or the library isn't following through on its strategic goals. Perhaps you have uh, the plans for professional development but haven't given concrete plans to implement those goals of professional development. Well, you'll want to uh, write a policy about that as far as support for uh, professional development. And uh, what I want to emphasize in this is that there are a lot of policies out there that you can download and look at, but they require editing. One size does not fit all libraries. So keep that in mind because I will have some resources where you can find policy examples. So let's talk a little bit about the process of developing policy. Can I ask a quick question, Karen? Um, how frequently should libraries review their existing policies? We talk about annually, but I know that in my board train, uh, training that, you know, you do have a lot of policies. You don't have to review them all on one date, all the policies on one date, but, but would want to establish a regular cycle to review policies. Um, and annually is good. You, you don't want them to become stale and dated, and you want to keep them relevant. I know a library that I used to work at, they had a policy um, schedule, and they reviewed a policy at every board meeting, at least one policy, sometimes two. Yeah, that's a good practice. Yeah. All right, the process. So the process is to research policies and find those closest to your needs that you can modify. And it's really good to see what others are doing, but be mindful of your library's unique needs. 
Then you write the policy and you do have staff input and then it requires some revision. You know, after you do that writing, there's quite a bit of revision. And then you get to the point, as I said, the library board approves all policies and that you will eventually have the board approve it. But one other, other step is important and that's the legality and have your library attorney review that policy in terms of legality and fairness to all. Then once the board approves the policy, you can distribute it. So the writing process is, is you know, pretty much like most writing processes. It's a, a rigorous process. There may be several drafts before you have one ready for review. It's important not to be vague. You have a, a wide range of readers, so you need to avoid jargon, but be brief. For example, a dress policy for staff needs to be detailed about what is not acceptable. So for example, in your dress codes, you could say appropriate shirts, but that might be vague, whereas more specific, you would say no tank tops. So keep that in mind when writing policies. It has to be valid and legally enforceable. It needs to conform to the current law. And that's why that part where the attorney reviews is very important. So the library board with attorney feedback gauges the policy for validity and legality. This is why it needs to be read to make sure it's in compliance with law and not being discriminatory. And it says there on that uh, fortune cookie, keep your expectations reasonable. And we touch on that a little bit uh, when we talk about some of those policies that uh, uh, pro, you know, eventually bar a patron from the library. You need to have a, written in there as far as the procedures, how that person can get back into good standing and that it's not forever. You know, we've seen some that have been a little bit uh, uh, unreasonable. So the first step is to have a policy statement. It's a brief statement that describes why the library does something. The example I give here is from the Indiana State Library to ensure that all patrons and visitors are able to use the library resources and services effectively. The Indiana State Library requires all visitors to comply with applicable federal, state, local laws, as well as the rules and regulations. I give a link on there and that goes to the rules and regulations. And I have been in a number of libraries that post their rules and regulations right on the door. So you know what those expectations are. And you can find um, uh, on these next slides, I give the criteria for that policy statement. And Karen, are you going to be able to share your slides? I am going to be able to share my slides. Great. What will happen after this webinar is I'll close caption it, but it'll also be on those archived webinars as a PowerPoint. Great, thanks. Do you actually send out the PowerPoint to the participants? I know that some have done that in the past. Sometimes we do, but I think in this case, we'll probably just include it on that landing page. Okay. Yeah. Criteria for a policy statement. As I said, it, it's brief. Again, you don't want to go, don't want it to be wordy. And that uh, it describes what you want to accomplish, just like we saw in the previous slide. We, we want to accomplish that, you know, everybody can use the library effectively. And you write it from the cu customer's point of view, you know, what is it that, that the result is going to be for them. And then that policy statement, like the, uh, policy is approved by the library board and they have input on that. Besides the legality of the policy, it is also informed by the professional ethics of the library prof profession. As we see here, it is uh, an ethic, as we see from the American Library Association, that to make re resources and services of the library known to its potential users, 
impartially. You know, there's no uh, uh, service for this one person and not another. It's impartial service rendered to all. And it's the, the other aspect is confidentiality and privacy. So equal access to all and privacy and confidentiality of the patron who use the library. Now having said all this, what is really going on is that there's going to be a board meeting where they deliberate about the policy. So, you know, uh, the staff has had their input and it's brought before the board and they deliberate. Is this policy really necessary? Is it consistent with our mission statement? So it takes everything into consideration as you write and revise it. I think where we see issues with a particular pro policy at the Indiana State Library, that is those policies that are sent to me in, into the library development office, is is it practical and enforceable as I, I mentioned, particularly in the area of patron behavior and the suspension of library privileges? I think these are a really good list of questions just to even have in front of you when you're assessing your own policies. And that sometimes I feel like boards maybe don't really know what questions to ask. So this is great to have this list. I think. I think that's a great point, yeah. So what's required in a board approval is the usual, a simple majority approval, and you sign and date the policy. And it's very important to keep these policies all in the manual. I know that in my past positions, we've usually had that manual of policies right at the public service desk, so there's easy access um, to, to know what, to, how you need to respond equitably and for your user. So once that, um, well, let's go on. We're going to talk about different types of policies. And I know that uh, in the annual report, we asked you about a number of policies, uh, more than what I have listed here, these general policies about staff conduct, patron conduct, and access. But these are the kind of ones I've kind of talked about today. And I will talk about some specific ones, in particular, internet use policy. But you don't have to file those policies with the Indiana State Library. You keep those and retain them in your records, particularly for audit purposes but you don't have to mail those into the library development office. Although I do have samples and sometimes I'll ask for some samples, but as a regular practice, those don't have to be filed with the state library, except for the internet use policy. And we'll talk a little bit about that on a, uh, another slide. The, the major one we talk about is everybody should have the access policy, and that's that one that's informed by the ethics that uh, you're not going to deny or abridge uh, privileges to people based on religion, race, social, economic, or political status, and so forth. And then also that you're going to abide by the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act to provide everybody an accommodation so that you can provide them with library materials, information, even uh, for patrons with impairments. And then specifically the rights of library users, it, we talk about circulation. That's one specific one. The collection development policy uh, is informed by the American Library Association and the Freedom or the Library Bill of Rights and the Freedom to Read. And we'll have the links at the end of the slides where you can access that. And they are, um, it's a broad base on providing materials for recreation, education, and information for all ages in all viewpoints. But sometimes people complain about something that's in your collection and you have to have a policy to uh, deal with those complaints and challenges. And this is a, a kind of a, a laundry list of things that you'd want to have to respond to a complaint. Uh, the name of the challenged material and so forth and that the librarian shall read the book to review the material noting the objections and that the personal bias or prejudice is not a valid reason for objection. And 
that your decision whether you're going to remove that book or material is based on the same consi considerations as when you selected the material and that the complainant will be notified of the decision by the library director and the board. I find that having a procedure in place um, for challenges is so helpful for the frontline staff because sometimes if you get a patron that comes up to your desk and they're angry about something, it's, it's much easier to say, you know, I understand that you're angry, we have a policy, um, so let's go ahead and get it out and take a look at it and you and I can work through this together. You know, that way the patron really feels respected and heard. Um, and then you know what steps to take. Yeah, that's so important to be proactive and let them know that you're listening to them and, and this is, we have a process for that and these are the steps. All right, the internet use policy. I kind of mentioned that earlier, that this is one we do want to have file on the, at the Indiana State Library. It's found in the Indiana code there and it tells you what needs to be in that policy. So here's a, here's a policy statement. The library provides access to computer hardware and software to the internet for the patron's use. All users of the library's computer resources are expected to use these resources correctly and for only legal purposes. And then you can go on, you know, in your policy, policy to state more detail as far as uh, there are different points of view represented, represented on the internet and we can't control, the library staff cannot control websites which often change rapidly and unpredictably. Users and caregivers are hereby notified that they are responsible for the websites they reach and parents of minor children must assume responsibility for their children's use of the internet through the library's con connection. And then if you filter, you would talk about the filtering software on the computers to pre prevent against depiction of obscenity, child pornography, and materials harmful to minors. And though you, you know, this ideally protects them that you are, um, it's technically impossible to prevent all access to uh, objectionable material. So you've kind of protected yourself there from uh, legally. So not only do we have that internet uh, use policy in the um, Indiana code, we also find about it in the Code of Federal Regulations. That you need to have a public notice and meeting or hearing. This generally applies to those libraries um, that receive federal funding in the form of E-rate and LSTA funds. So the annual reviews don't have to be hearings. The board can just review the policy annually at an open meeting, the same as they would review any other policy. And as I said, this is this hearing happens once. Okay. Are there any questions on that? Nope, we're okay. So all policies need to be reviewed at regular interviews, inter intervals to make sure they still apply and that they are no that they are relevant not dated and remember I, I talked about policy mostly in this presentation but there's also procedures there's a relationship between policies and procedures though they achieve different ends using the general guidelines of board policies the director and staff write rules and regulations for the operation of the library. For example, your library board may develop a policy that says the library will have a video collection for public lending. The director and staff then write guidelines for purchasing materials for the collection, lending rules for the collection, and various other regulations necessary to maintain and manage the collection. As a general rule of thumb, are policies usually shorter than procedures? Uh, yes, because I, I think procedures are a step-by-step -step, right. uh, 
explanation. And Karen, do you ever see examples of policies where they have a lot of procedural information included that could actually be pulled out? Or are people pretty oh. adept at just keeping it at the policy that, level? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't seen them include much procedure okay. in the policy. Good. You know, because what we're looking for, as we said earlier, is one one that's you know precise, Brief. yeah, not too wordy, mm -hmm. so it's straight to the point. So yes, the policies would be not in that. The procedures. Procedures would not be in the policy, but the procedure is another step by step thing. I can also imagine that there are times of the year when it's important to make sure that certain policies are ready to go. For example, meeting, roos, meeting room use right before an election season. I think it's helpful to make sure that that's, everyone understands what the policy is. That's correct, because we've had those kind of que uh, questions, and we do have some examples at the library about, you know, where can people distribute, you know, political information and so forth, you know. And it's okay for them to distribute on the sidewalk by the library that's public space so if you get those kinds of questions and you need some feedback just give me a holler or you can give my colleague a holler Angela Fox there are two of us here so you know if I'm not here you can ask Angela okay that kind of brings us towards the end but I actually go into quite detail on my uh, resources so I'm going to tell you what I told you and I welcome any questions. We focused on operational policies and not managerial policies, but I do have personnel manuals and information on that. Should you require that, you can contact me uh, later. And the focus is, was for small and medium-sized libraries. That's where I get most of the questions. And then I talked about the policy statement and writing and revising policy, and that policies govern the people relationships. And the day-to-day -day operations of the library are governed by policies that prevent confusion and direct decisions and action, so there's consistent treatment of library users. When a policy is needed, the staff and the library board both have input though the library board is responsible for approving policy. And then that all important part that you uh, need to have a, a legal uh, to, to read it at, at times. I know that we had that question uh, once with the food for fines, that that needs to be read by, uh, reviewed by a library attorney. So be sure to keep the policies up to date, all gathered in one place in a notebook and be sure to weed them and update annually with a regular review. Now, I'm gonna go into a little detail here on my resources. If you read In the Public Trust, and I, and I hope you do, chapter three deals with the board develops policy, so that would be a nice good chapter to share with your library board. In that paragraph I read to you at the introduction is from this book, The Public Library Policy Writer, a, a Neil Schumann book and we have that here at the State Library. And that last resource is a web page from the State of New York uh, Board of Trustees. Now obviously their laws are not the same as ours, but you can find all kinds of policies in there that might give you a jumping off point to help you develop your policy. It's actually the one I consult when people ask me about policies that I don't have you know, in hand. And this slideshow on slideshare.net is became the kind of impetus for my presentation, so I list it there as a resource. And we have some great resources on our website. And these are ones that are on the library resources page, the law resources page. These are the audio recordings of the interns that Sylvia Watson had. They did one on social media, library meeting rooms, and the First Amendments. And then Angela Moore did one on library behavior policies. And I'm not sure, I don't think these are accessed through um, PDOs. I think they're not, but I'm writing a note to maybe put them over there. Okay, because they are on the law resources page that you can get to at, off of uh, uh, the LDO webpage. Right. And websites. 
I, as I told you, I was going to give you the links to where you could find the ALA Bill of Rights. If you haven't, you've been out of library school for a little while, and you need to check that out again. And then also the Freedom to Read statement, because those are the backbones of pretty much everything we, you know, what library profession is about. And then I've put some rather specific ones here about support animals. There was a while back when we had a lot of questions about support animals. So we not only have that one there, an ALA resource, we also have the Indiana State Library uh, legal memo about ADA and service animals. And that's it. Okay. Are there any questions? I have several that I've written down, and if anyone has other questions, feel free to go ahead and type them in the chat box. People have been a little bit quiet today, so I don't know if they're all thinking about other things. <laughs> um, so one of the things you said was a little fascinating to me, and that's that policy should be written from the customer's point of view. So I thought that was really interesting because I think a lot of times we feel like the policy is from the library, and so it should be from our point of view. Can you just talk a little bit more about, I don't know, about that? Yeah, I think it has to go with expectations. What is the what is the behavior, particularly in behavior, what do we expect the patron? And I think that uh, really if you can get that mindset that thinks about the customer, what what is what, is, what am I going to get out of this, you know? I, it, what what uh, is the role that uh, I play in this process in, in terms of uh, the best example I can think of is the behavior. Yeah. And that's because the staff needs to have good behavior too. You know, it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. And it's, you don't, one way I heard it is you don't want to be telling them, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that. You, you don't, you want to avoid saying no. So you want it to be, phrased po positively from, you know, consideration of the uh, customer. I think that's great. Um, and the other thing that's great about that is, of course, we exist to serve our patrons. So if we make our policies patron-centric or from their patron's point of view, that just serves to sort of uh, reinforce that fact. We do have a question that came on. If we don't uh, – Sally says, we don't have a lawyer. Is using the sample policies on the State Library page – sufficient or does each policy have to have a lawyer read them this is a tricky one this is a tricky one and I and the only example I can think of is that we you we do require you to we, we don't require you but the State Board of Accounts requires that that food for fines policy be reviewed by an attorney now people ask me why because there's some some legality I mean obviously some of your patrons will be able to participate in that food for fines and others won't. So we need to make sure that it's non-discriminatory, I believe, is why the State Board of Accounts wants that to be reviewed by the attorney. I don't think they all need to be reviewed by the attorney. Uh, I, I know that that's the only one that uh, has been brought to my attention here at the State Library. And then if, if libraries have challenge have a challenge finding someone, is it possible that there could be someone in their community that might review these policies pro bono? I've never found the answer to that, okay. but we would be happy to uh, connect you to sources to find attorneys. And, and I say that, you know, like a, I don't have the backing for that just yet. I mean, I could ask, uh, there are directories for attorneys and how to find information from attorneys, but it doesn't hurt to just call up a few and, and see what uh, what's available. Uh, we have a comment. She says, my city hall attorney will often review things for us. We don't have an attorney either since we are small. So that's a great tip. Yeah, that's a great to idea. To see if the city hall attorney will help review your policy. That's great. Okay, we have a couple other folks typing. While they're typing, um, I just wanted to clarify so the internet use policy, is that the only one that they're required to send into the State Library? I think you said that, but I just wanted to confirm that. That is correct. The one um, policy that we want filed on file here at the State Library is the internet use policy, because sometimes I have to uh, consult that because I've been contacted by uh, E-rate. Uh, I don't handle LSTA, but it's another one that's required for federal funds such as LSTA. Can I close this and, yeah, and make my uh, LEU available? Sure, absolutely. 
Um, we have another question specifically about Food for Fines. Um, Brenda is asking, was Food for Fines reviewed at the beginning of the session? If not, could you explain that? We haven't actually talked about it in too much detail, just basically what Karen had just said. I can get your comments. All right. Food for Fines. That's if you offer a program, and, and, and this usually happens around Thanksgiving, usually. People have a policy where the, you can bring in perishable goods and that your fines will be forgiven up to a certain level on certain items, you know. Obviously, uh, the, there are caveats, and I have various food for fine policies, but usually people put a dollar limit on it. You can forgive so many dollars worth of fines in that um, it has to be perishable item in, you know, not dented cans or whatever. Sometimes it gets as specific as that, but I don't have one of those policies in front of me. But that's what Foods for Fines is. Okay. And our major caveat with that is just that a lawyer should review it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I know that the internet use policy is the only policy that they're required to send in to the state library, but there are other policies that they're required to have. I don't know that you know that list off the top of your head, but can you give us a couple of examples of required policies? Well, hopefully you got from my presentation that you should have an access policy. Um, collection development policy, there's certain required ones, and I think it's in the uh, standards. And I'd have to look at the mm -hmm. standards to see that list. But there's also a chapter in the new director's manual on uh, policies that there's a list, but it's it's not a, um, I guess, legal list that you have to have all these, but it just makes good sense. Like, uh, like I said, you don't want to be caught short that you have an emergency situation and you don't, you don't have a policy mm -hmm. to cover that, but obviously in, that happens sometimes, so you try to anticipate that. Right. Some other good policies to have would be like a nepotism policy. I find that that's mm -hmm. awfully helpful in public libraries since, you know, we're all coming from the same community and sometimes when you have small communities and people are related and um, so that's a helpful one to have, I think. Well, I think that the nepotism policy is incorporated pretty much in your probably your personnel manual and then also the, the library board has to be concerned about nepotism and right. incorporate that into their bylaws. But um, I was just thinking of a policy... I can't remember what it was. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, Sally asks, do we need to send you a hard copy of the required policies, which is really just the internet service policy, um, or is it okay to send a file through email? It's, it's okay to send a file through email. So that's great. Also, I just wanted to mention we do have your LAU form up on the screen right now, so all you have to do to download that is click on the name of the file, and then the download file button will activate, and you'll be able to download. Um, I have one more question. I'm not sure if you know the answer to this. Uh, do you know, you mentioned that some of the resources that you talked about are available here at the State Library. You mentioned the book in particular. Um, public libraries can borrow from our collections, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. You're welcome to borrow from our collection, and we kind of talk about it as the professional collection. I mean, ideally, we like to have a second copy of the book, but I don't think that always applies to the professional collection, because you know those are, those are expensive books. So I, we'll, we'll loan a copy of that resource I just mentioned, though we only have one copy of it, so make sure it gets back to us. Right. <laughs> and then the other... Uh, I'm trying to remember prohibition is we don't lend anything that's older than 1970. Is that it? I'm not sure, but that's something like that. Sounds like a good rule. That of sounds thumb. right. But for our, for our professional collection, usually you, you contact me and I go ahead and uh, let them know at the CERC desk and they route it to uh, uh, the professional, usually the director at a, at a library. So do they have to check it out with a library card? Yes, okay. I, I believe that. Uh, there's library cards on file with the, the CERP desk down here at the State Library. For, for, the, for every library? For every library, yeah. I believe. Well, that's interesting. We might want to clarify that, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, we'll get that clarified. But I haven't had any trouble in the past. We usually check it out to that library and, and route it to them through Info Express. Great. Okay. Um, I think the last question we have is when will this recording be available? Um, Karen and I mentioned early on in the recording or in the 
webinar today that one of our tech people is out, and she's the one that normally sends the recording link. So we won't have it for you today, I don't think, but we could probably have it as early as tomorrow. And again, it won't be transcribed or on YouTube, but um, we'll still be able to send the Adobe Connect link out as early as tomorrow. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Were there any last comments, Karen? Uh, no more comments, um, but thank you all for attending. Uh, I appreciate it, and I hope you take away from this the importance of policies and, uh, and uh, go ahead and review your policies and make sure they're up to date and uh, not stale and dated. Yeah, absolutely, and I guess my thought is get a schedule worked out so that you can review you know, all of your policies annually and be sure to take a look for when new things happen. Um, Maybe you'll have to write a new policy. Okay, thanks everyone.